So say we take a random sample of a thousand people, a thousand people, and I don't know, say, just make the numbers easy. One percent, one percent will have COVID if you sample a random thousand people. They'll have COVID <laughs> right now. I'm laughing because it's way higher, but yeah. I, I just want to make the math easy. Right? Oh no. I want to make the math easy. <laughs> oh no. So what does that mean? One percent of a thousand people have a COVID. Ten. Ten people. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo. Ten people. All right. <laughs> yes. Put Ten me on people the spot. should have COVID. But now, there the problem with the test is there's a false positive rate of five percent. Okay. False positive meaning y- you you test that you have COVID but you really don't have it. Yeah. Okay. So if it's a 5% uh, false positive rate, now you go and you get a COVID test. And they're like, Henry, you have COVID. Okay. What are the odds that you have COVID? Easy. I've heard this before. I'm not going to do this on the spot. The podcast is going to come crumbling it down. <laughs> Welcome to the Smart Nonsense Podcast, where we talk about entrepreneurship, self-development, and challenging norms. Today, we Woo! don't know. What we're going to do, because this is Fooled by Randomness by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Okay. Uh, Notorious for the book Anti-Fragile, which I really didn't like and didn't finish. But here we are. You tricked me into reading this one. Are we closer than we are normally? I don't know. We got knees touching. Should people subscribe? Should people subscribe? Yeah, yeah. One of those those would be good. Pick, (laughs) Pick a platform. We got a bunch of them. We got YouTube buzzsprout uh, apple spotify we're everywhere baby you can't stop us <laughs> they thought we could be stopped you can. i just boogered all over myself holy <laughs> shit watch us on youtube that's the most important they can't stop us but we can certainly stop ourselves <laughs> we i mean they might stop themselves from watching after seeing the last couple episodes we were bunkered we're back. down we're in the studio mm, hey <laughs> The sign's back. We got a lot of tea it's coming early in the day. I think that's the... We've been shooting at like 4 or 5 p.m. before. It's not good. It's not good. Uh, gonna this see. is going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy, but I heard the other day that the... Maybe it's different for everyone, but your most down moment in the day is 1 to 3 p.m. And we were recording on the tail end of that. Well, it's and 2 that- p.m. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Woo-hoo-hoo! Right. I wake up at 11. Let's get into it here because we're already running late. I got things to do, but I'm happy mm. to be back. Yes, yes. Fooled by randomness. Uh, well, here, let me just start with a little connection, all right? Should we start with who it's uh, for? That's or? true. We should do that. All Sometimes right, we right. have a format. So, yeah, say some format stuff. Um, Who's it for? I think two people. One being that lucky fool exactly. Taleb talks me about. Me and you. <laughs> me and you. I think... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's for two people. It's get it together. It's for two people, not me, not just me and you. Um, Taleb talks about the lucky fools, the people that just kind of uh, leave things to variance and get really lucky, and then claim that uh, the, the byproduct of their luckiness was was their own doing. And then I think people on the other side, you probably myself, <laughs> that are so deterministic, so probabilistic in our heads that. Um, uh, we're we're very skeptical about a lot of the f- processes that happen in the world. I think that's a good mm-hmm. thing to be skeptical about, but it's a double-edged sword. Yeah, being too skeptical. I like. See, here's the thing. I thought you were gonna say two people. You were like, this book is for Nero and Steve. I don't know who and, Nero and Steve are. Oh my god! That's <laughs> <laughs> like half the book is about Nero and Steve. All right, and Kahneman. Well, the idea. I guess we start the book. It goes all over the place. Let me just make something really clear. When I listen to these books and we do them in like two hours, Nero and Steve is. No. Well, yeah. I don't you ever know. To you, I, um, tell me what they were talking about on Nero and Steve. Well, and I'm with you. But all right. uh, names. Not, they're the not neighbors. They're the neighbors. And Nero's the oh. one that's just he's playing it safe. <laughs> they're, they're both traitors. And Nero's just taking the conservative approach where he's making his money. He's not making crazy money, but he's limiting the downside risk whereas you get people like steve and steve's got the two ferraris in the garage he's got the smoking hot wife going out crazy places they can't even pronounce and he just like big dicks nero and nero's feeling all self-conscious his wife's like why are we poor but then steve who had a hundred million dollars overnight goes bankrupt because this black swan event blow up yeah just blows up and so the book a lot of it traces back to this game of russian roulette 
And basically, like, you can win big. But what they don't know is that they're playing Russian roulette every time that they're risking all of this. So that's what happened with Steve. That's what happens with a lot of people. And they just end up disappearing. And you never hear of them again. This little survivorship bias. So all the Steves, they just crush it for a little bit. But then they're gone because they're, they're basically just playing the Russian roulette game after game after game. But there's so many chambers. It's not just, like, six chambers that they forget. And then they kill Monte themselves. Carlo. Hey, here's what I thought was really interesting. I love when we <laughs> just buzzwords. Hey, this is the word. No, one thing I think is interesting. Didn't know Nero and Steve, but we just explained the same two types of people. So maybe I learned something. But um, I thought that was the best new thing I learned in this book was this idea of qualitative probability. The notion that we've talked about that Russian roulette experiment on here before. You hear me? I'm, a, no, I'm coming making in sure we're recording. Can you hear here. me in your car? I get nervous. Uh, <laughs> you don't know if we're recording. Um, oh, what was I saying? Qualitative. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the Russian roulette, which we talked about here before, right? Like you could run that simulation on one person, basically give them $10 million, tell them to play Russian roulette. Um, some people are going to get lucky and get the $10 million. But if that person keeps playing, they're not going to live for 10 or 20 years. Like their head's going to get blown off. Now let thousands of people play that game of Russian roulette and a whole bunch of people are going to win and they're going to survive and they're going to thrive and they're going to be 10 millionaires. And those are the ones you hear about. That's the survivorship. That was brilliant. And that's that's who we worship. And then we attribute all this stuff. Like they talk about the millionaire next door, which I read that book a while back. And it's like, oh, these are all the traits. Like they're they're incredibly hardworking and they're risk taking and they're whatever adventurous, frugal, whatever it is. But then you're like, well, who else is risk taking? Probably the failures <laughs> yeah. that blow up. Like like they're they're kind of there's a lot of this correlation causation stuff and then this like survivorship bias of like oh now we're gonna worship i was just listening to, listening to a podcast about this they're like we worship say steve jobs but who's to say he's the reason that apple's that way what if it was just like apple's this this beast and he was just along for the ride so actually oh we're we're tan mm. yeah. there's so much here like there's no real organization but basically like think of it like a bunch of monkeys right and the monkeys their their thing is like making typing in the iliad if you have enough monkeys out there just typing away like billions and billions of monkeys eventually one of them is going to accidentally stumble upon the complete iliad or name your favorite fooled by randomness they just by typing random book. letters right but that's not really that impressive just because there's so many monkeys out there so you you wouldn't be like oh this monkey that just wrote the iliad he's got something special like let's look oh what did he do this morning oh he, he woke up and ate two bananas Oh, everyone's got to eat two bananas to, to write the Iliad. But then you're like, well, if you took that same monkey and told him to write the Odyssey, there's no fucking way he'd do that. <laughs> Gibberish tomorrow. Whereas if you had just five monkeys and one of them wrote the Iliad, you'd be like, oh, shit. Maybe this monkey's on to something. And then he could actually write the Odyssey. So that's kind of the whole idea is like the Nassim doesn't automatically put a Warren Buffett on a pedestal. Because everyone and their mother is investing. Yeah. And then only the survivors are going to show up. The rest just disappear. And uh, he, he says yeah. it really nicely in one point. It's like um, hard work, skills, and labor can get you to like averageness and, yeah. uh, or middle earning, whatever. High, high, highly successful, wildly successful, high earning all described by variants. That's it. Yeah, I mean, I've heard Warren Buffett, I, I forget which, I think it was his letter to shareholders where he said like, this is why I'm not random because he could predict who would be another successful investor based on certain traits right. of value. Right, investing. so Warren Buffett actually just has like supernatural judgment, right? But then there's, there's 8,000 people or is it the same kind of thing with Warren Buffett where like, we're trying to, like the monkeys, we're like, oh, he woke up today. And we, you hear it all the time. It's like he eats a cheeseburger and a Diet Coke every meal or for lunch or yeah, whatever. Yeah, people, I mean, they just rationalize the shit out of anything. But uh, I think that's that's the one counter argument. Whereas, like, you take, I don't know, who's another, I don't know, some other random rich person. And then you tell them, hey, predict the next few rich people. They probably couldn't do it because whatever traits they look up to aren't, aren't real. Mm -hmm. um, so th there's just a lot of that. A lot of people just got to realize we're all playing Russian roulette or like 
Oh, take it to this this little example. You know, I think it mentioned in the book, but I've heard of this before, where it's illegal to send out, say, like... The lottery mail? Yeah, yeah, the lottery mail with, like, sports games. Oh, tomorrow, the Patriots are going to win. And then you send it out, mm-hmm. and half the people get Patriots, half the people get the Packers. And then, guess what? Now you just say the Patriots actually won. Now, to the Patriot winners, you send another mail, and it's like, oh, this game... Green Bay is going to beat the Buccaneers and then Green Bay wins. And then you just send it to that people and you keep whittling it down until you have like, say you start with a million people, you have like a hundred people and they're like, wow, they, they bet correctly in the last 10 or whatever it is. And now they believe you're, you're some sort of God and you scam them for a a lot of money. So that's illegal, but that's basically what, what the market is doing. That's what the world is doing every day with all these people playing at once and just like, right. uh, So that's a survive. That's a, survivorship scheme yeah yeah your but, your your letters that are correct are surviving and the the all the ones that were wrong in that chain mail scheme get thrown out yeah that's a nice way to, to I, the other way i like to think about it um they talked about monte carlo which i like because he admitted how like brute force it is um and mathematicians hate it but <laughs> he likened he likened all these events what are they called sample paths Mm. Right. So um, and there's like infinite sample paths for anything. But but one that I thought was nice was you go into a casino. One sample with with a thousand dollars, one sample path shows you walking out of that casino with a million and a half dollars. And the other is you walking to the uh, taxi broke. Yeah. Um, And so they use these Monte Carlo simulations to just predict by brute force all of the possible paths that can happen in any given event. And then, well, you look at, say, take some, uh, they talk about like the rich dentist yeah. and they're like the, the variance for a dentist is like a hundred K to like 500 K. And so if, if you're in that, it's, you could be neighbors with someone that just won the lottery and now they're living in this beautiful neighborhood. But would you rather be the dentist who's gonna in most outcomes be in that neighborhood versus like the random lottery winner, like you and your little scratch offs. Right. That suddenly strikes big. on Cause, half a million cause dollars. the dentist profession is non-random. It's like, it's the same every day. It's the same for every dentist, more or less painting with a broad brush. But then, so yeah, their, their average salary is mm-hmm. often very similar. Now you look at entrepreneurs and options, traders, investors, very random profession. And you get this high variance where basically variance or noise, he even said at one point, describes everything. Noise, dis- noise, outcomes were like 1,000 parts noise to one part productivity, uh, I remember hearing. We get it. There's so many little little snippets that I apply to my yeah. daily life. Like, okay. It just doesn't the, matter. Flip the a noise coin. versus actual signal. What I love is like, how often are you checking your stocks if they go up or down, okay? You have the option of <laughs> checking every second, like literally every second of the day, every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month, every year. So if you say there's like a, whatever, 90% chance that it's, I forget the exact stats. I wish I wrote it down, but oh, here it is. I, I, did, I did write it down. Okay. 93% chance at the end of the year. So if you just check it once, 93% chance it's going to be up. But if you check it at the end of the first month or any month, this is 67% chance it's up. So you're like already you go from like pretty much every time you're going to be happy to now it's just like two thirds of the time. But if you go all the way down to like every single second, you're basically checking it around the clock. There's pretty much a a 50.02% chance. Wait, I missed it. Sorry. I yelled. What a lot of people do 50.02% chance that it's going to be positive. Anytime you check like going up or down. So you think the people that check every single hour or day, like they're just subjecting themselves to all these little like, oh, fuck, I'm down. Oh, fuck, it just went down. Oh, fuck, it just went down. When realistically- It's torture. It's subjecting yourself to torture. It's crazy. Yeah. So he's like, this makes no sense. You're literally getting all noise because there's so much variance in the market that it just doesn't make sense to to look at these signals because they're not signals. Let's stay on stock market. Wow, we're on it today. Hmm. Um. A, a really interesting one is this idea of abstractness versus specific events. And one that I thought was really interesting is 
I believe he said the 18 months prior to the attacks on 9-11 in the stock market were more volatile than the 18 months after 9-11, the events of 9-11. But we only ever hear about how volatile mm. and very how much variance there was after the attacks because it was a specific event we could point to. Um, and it's just like, that's what kind of drives me crazy is when people take, um, it's a lot of news media and like, oh, here we go again. It's a word that starts with E, he says. Uh, but that's what people latch onto and remember and they're not even looking at, at the full picture. Well, that's what I love is he's like, I know this inside and out. I know all of these, or at least my brain knows all of these cognitive biases and I know the truth, but my heart doesn't give a fuck. My heart is this like evolutionarily super old beast that just relies on emotions and I get emotional and I'm just trying to like not fall victim to this as much as everyone else. <laughs> but he often does. He says like even he says uh, that's even worse almost because you know, and you still fall victim. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be inferior. I mean, look at opportunity costs. Mm. We're no better. But by the way, we are no better when it comes to Wait. all these biases. It's 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 monkey brain stuff. Mm. But if you can at least like turn that dial down some Wait. on how much they make you give, give impulse to what you're doing, then I guess we didn't say anything control. about Taleb. Fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Well, he was a traitor in case you wanted to know. That's kind of why he came into this. One, one thing wait, I, wait, I think that's nice because I was listening to the book. I was like, wow, this is, we should really just go to the source. It's all thinking fast and slow. I haven't read it. Maybe we should. Mm. Um, but I thought he puts a nice options trading spin on it in terms of hedging. And like you said, um, hedging with knowing downside. Yeah. He's like, I mean, I'll tell people all my secrets and they're still just fucking <laughs> animals and I make killings off of them, like uh, an absurd amount of money. So it's like people are just, this is human nature and we can't really avoid it, but it's good to be cognizant of it. And, and so he just shits on people all the time. Like economists, he's like, this is pseudoscience. He hates people that talk on television. One, one cool one that's this, this idea, people don't really understand magnitude. So for example, he went to speak and someone was like someone in the audience asked him like oh Nassim are you um are you bullish or bearish on the market and bullish means you think it's gonna go up bearish is gonna go down and he's like oh I'm I'm bullish and like well if you're bullish why did you just say yesterday that you have all these puts <laughs> like you're, you're basically betting against the market you're gonna bet that it's gonna go down it was like yeah I think the majority of the time it is gonna go up but when it goes down, it's going to be so significant. It's going to crater that I'm going to make money. And so he's just like, basically the trader is taking all these little losses for the black swan event where it goes down and the magnitude is so big that he makes a killing. So people can't really understand that. If you, if you think the market's going up, why would you say it's going to go down? But you need to understand that magnitude factors in. And so it's, it's kind of like, I think they say people are used to the symmetric risk where it's like there's equal probabilities. Mm -hmm. It's like that that beautiful, what is that called? A uh, bell curve? <laughs> bell curve. But like- The wall. <laughs> the wall, that's stupid. Show. Great I show. I hate that. Uh, <laughs> but like these long tail events, he talks about them. There's like very major catastrophes could happen. There's- uh, And they do, like that's a fact of the matter. And a lot of people don't realize it. I saw like oh four crashes on my way over here today. But like improbable things happen all the time. He he shits on uh, I think it was like the Black Shoals model. I don't know if you ever got into that in Black economics. Black Shoals. Maybe it was just like the higher up classes. But I really, think, <laughs> I never understood it. But uh, <laughs> it was it was something to like measure risk or whatever. And so they they tried to kind of put their own skin in the game and created their own hedge fund or something like that. And they just got wiped out by the market. Keep in mind, these people want to know about prize for their model and they get wiped out by the market and they're like, oh, it was like a 10 Sigma event as in, hmm. in the history of the universe, it never should have happened. Like several universe histories for it to happen. And it seems like, so you're telling me that we're going to trust you that your model was right. And it was this event that should have never happened versus you're just a moron 
and that it, got it wrong. And it happened. And it, it was a lot more likely than you thought. And it's like people just worship you said they, them. You said they won a Nobel Prize for that? Yeah, the, for the – well, not necessarily for like – For something. For something. their risk they're, they're, evaluation they're model, whatever. the smartest was. PhDs in – in the field yeah hmm. so that's the thing he, he brings up like people make these errors all the time often like stats people more than anyone else well and he says science great scientists not so great right? mm. for that for that same reason they're human beings they may be uh, assured of all these biases that doesn't mean they're not applying them to their work doubly so scientists are the ones that are so hard-headed he says that mm. they've made it into that profession in the first place. Um, well, that's so they can they can really like uh, um, com uh, confirm, right? They can confirm themselves into their their own findings. Yeah, it it gets into a lot of his other like skin in the game that which I also recently read, and it's like all these people. Like if they're just in their ivory tower studying, like they have no real skin in the game. Like he's a big fan of you're out in the real world and you need to test your theories to like make money or like benefit yourself. You're going to make sure that they actually work and make sense. But you have all these people that just like create this lofty theoretical model. Why do you, what is your little giggly face? All right, I don't fucking know what's going on with Belky, but <laughs> people people create this, and then they have this consistency. Like if you ever read um, Influence by Cialdini, like uh -uh. you go out and put a picket, a, a sign in front of someone's uh, house. You're like, oh, do you love the environment? And like, yeah, you put a sign out there. They're more likely to to vote in your favor or like come help you clean up trash or whatever because they want to be consistent with what they said in the past. Uh. So people are very hard headed for that reason, especially scientists which they shouldn't be. What was that? Um, what was, I, I'm just giggling because I always think it's funny that we're sitting here recording. It's just awesome. Um, it's just like, look check, at us. Check your privilege. It's hilarious. Check your privilege. Um, what was that? That uh, it wasn't a bias. You, you threw out last night, Lin, Lindy. Lin oh yeah. The Wendy effect. Yeah. I like that one. I like that one. And yeah. the Linda effect. Yeah. I, which is the, always the bank teller and the feminist. Oh, People are really Separate. bad at conditional probability. Yeah. So, okay. Oh, then give me the Lindy effect. That well, was nice. You, you want to go through the bank teller one? Are you going to tell it properly? We have before. I, I probably won't tell it properly. Do you want me to generalize or, it? I always get it goofed up. It, but We can do it in multiple ways. Like, say, for example, um, you're buying insurance. and Or, or you're like, um, so you're getting on a plane. Plane insurance. Fucking <laughs> random example. I don't even think this makes sense. But uh, you, you're trying to sell someone insurance. You're like, oh, well, I'm going to insure in case something happens to your flight. Like, say there's a, a crash. And people are like, ah, I don't really want to buy it. You're like, oh, well, what if there's insurance for a terrorist event? And then you crash. And people are like, oh, terrorists. Like, they can very easily picture a terrorist event. And like, oh, I don't want that to happen. So they'll buy that more than they'll buy the general crash, which includes the terrorist act. Right. So it could just be a malfunction in the plane. could be terrorists. could be anything. And it's like, why wouldn't you just buy the more inclusive one? But people that just have That gets back this... to the abstract versus specificity right. of just like being able to assess your environment. That's why Tim Ferriss actually has but this. But wait, the original really quick. Fuck and then God, Tim Ferriss. Yeah. The original is Kahneman's bank teller who is a right. feminist experiment. And right. people confuse the subset. It was like, what's more likely, basically, that this person's a bank teller or a feminist or a bank teller feminist? Something right. like that. Well, it was like picture what would have happened like it, oh you, you oh, go the, yeah. you look at a i'm kind of making this up but you go and there's some rally or something you go and pick someone out of the rally what are the odds that they're a bank teller and a feminist or what are the odds that they're just a bank teller and like oh people oh, it's higher that they're a bank teller and a feminist because <laughs> yeah. it's like some okay, women's tim, rights rally or whatever. tim ferris okay tim ferris uh oh that's one thing he's just like availability heuristic like people run off these heuristics so like how easy is it for me to visualize this or like kind of uh, retrieve it that's what people cling to so for example he'll ask questions like what's the best book you ever read he doesn't ask that he asks what's the book you've gifted most mm. because it's super easy i can remember the fucking johnny bunko and poor charlie's almanac which i can what? very clearly say that whereas if it's like tell what the best book you ever read i'm like ah, oh, there's so many like i don't, I don't that's a great know. point so Kind of, kind of connected, but how do you how do you apply that to movies? I get asked that about movies a lot. What's your favorite movie? When was the last time you cried in a movie? Uh, 
like so i don't know i just kind of made that up but yeah. like something that's more that's easier to picture or like last time you laughed or like i don't know whatever you want to say um same thing with conditional probabilities in age oh you want to go f- well that that one's cool the lifespan yeah it's like so take the like he was watching tv one day and the person was like well the average person lives to the age of 85 so if you are 75 you have 10 years left to live and this is how you prepare and they gave them all this financial advice and it's like no you got to understand conditional probability yeah if at birth the average age is 85 but if you already made it to 75 that means a lot of people died earlier on like we know people that just haven't made it that long and so now your odds at 75 of making it to 85 are a lot higher than the average person. Right. So conditional probabilities develop with you. We once put my, my grandpa, who's like 86, Northwestern has like a, a life expectancy calculator. And if you put in all his criteria, whatever, heart disease, lung disease, age, like all these things, it spits out his expectancy is like 99 or mm-hmm. something, 102. Because if you've, I think it's once you've made it past 50 or 60, like likelihood that you'll die at very old ages. What, what was funny was like, okay, take that same commercial and it's like, oh, the average person is 75. And then your grandpa say, or whatever is like <laughs> 99. What? So he's got negative 14 years. Fuck. It's like, what the fuck does that, how do I prepare for negative 14 years? Like it literally Any doesn't make now. sense. Yeah. So when you put it in that, that frame, it's like, that's clearly just a bad mental math Mm -hmm. but everyone does it all the time uh even doctors so i like i was going to connect this to COVID at the beginning but it's this is the risk this is why i'm glad we did at the end because i don't know i don't know if i'll get the math right oh oh no (laughs) (laughs) the podcast has never been the same (laughs) we almost we i almost crashed the entire podcast did for a while yeah yeah we were lowest t around so here's the idea Okay, I, I'm gonna try and I'm gonna I'm gonna do a reach here. I practiced oh. in the bathroom. Earlier. Oh, that's what you were doing. Wait, yeah. wait, 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 wait. I think there's one thing I want to say first. Mm-hmm. It's a quick one. Yeah, let's get everything out first. Just, <laughs> let's get it all out there before you know. Okay, first of all, I hope you're here because you like us so much, and you're not gonna leave no matter what the math is. <laughs> but I just like that this this notion. Maybe this is where you're going, but the idea of framing things um, differently because people mm. are loss averse. So look at uh, a steak, right? We want to report that it's what 75 percent fat free instead of 25 percent fat. Or like lean. I think I got it wrong there, but the point is you Wait. can frame things two ways. And yeah, or it's like you have a 75 percent chance of surviving. Sounds a lot better than hey, 25% oh right, percent chance of dying. Right. Hey, another good one I I heard on TikTok the other day. Did you know percentages are reversible? So, getting you warmed up for the math here, Mm -mm. 50% of 10, what is it? Oh, didn't I tell you this before? Is 10% of 50. Yeah, I think we went over this before. Probably. I'll check the archives. Check the archives. I think it was in person, (laughs) if anything. Oh, yeah, that that did rail me. Is that how you do quick quick math? No. Like 16, okay, here here it was. 16% of 50 is the same as it, 50% eight. of 16, so it's eight. You just... All right, here we are, 20, 30, 40 odd minutes in. Uh, what is it? What's it about? At least prime me, prime me and the viewers. All right, there's some other stuff, but the, know, the book's long, so <laughs> you read it. All right, so here's the idea. Oh. Let's, let's look at Henry and I over the past few days and our COVID tests. Okay. All right. So say we take a random sample of a thousand people, a thousand people, and I don't know, say, just make the numbers easy. One percent, one percent will have COVID if you sample a random thousand people. They'll have COVID <laughs> right now. I'm laughing because it's way higher, but yeah. I, I just want to make the math easy. Right? Oh no. I want to make the math easy. <laughs> oh no. So what does that mean? One percent of a thousand people have a COVID. 10. 10 people. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo. 10 people. All right. <laughs> yes. Put 10 me people spot. should have COVID. But now the problem with the test is there's a false positive rate 
of 5%. Okay? False positive, meaning y- you you test that you have COVID, but you really don't have it. Yeah. Okay? So if it's a 5% uh, false positive rate, now you go and you get a COVID test. And like, Henry, you have COVID. Okay. What are the odds that you have COVID? Easy. I've heard this before. I'm not going to do this on the spot. The podcast is going to come crumbling it down. It's funny because literally this exact example with different uh, setup was in the book. But like <laughs> roughly, roughly, what do you think the odds are going to be? It, you just tested positive for COVID. Oh, man. At least 1%. No, no, it doesn't what? work like that. You just tested positive. Just think. This oh, 95%. All right, sure. If you want to answer like yeah. this, okay, this, yeah, yeah, <laughs> there yeah. you go. Hey, 95%. <laughs> That's what actually most doctors say. Is mm-hmm. they say 95%. Oh, cuz 5% are false positive. Just lop like, it off the top. That's what I do. There's a 95% chance that Henry tested positive for COVID, so he has actual COVID. But now let's look at the math, right? And this is where it's going to get dicey. But we have 10 people. <laughs> it's already dicey. We have 10 people that actually have COVID in this sample of 1000 people. Oh yeah. All right. But now let's look at how many tested positive that they have COVID, but they don't actually have it. 50. Uh, right around 50. I mean, it's right? 5%. It's like, oh, because it's 50 of 990. Okay. But let's, let's, let's call, call it 50. 50. Right. God, for me, call it 50. So 50 people are basically like fake, fake COVID people when only 10 actually have it. So then you're like, yeah, because it's 1%. That's 10 people. So, 10 over 60 total people, mm-hmm. 50 plus 10. Yeah. So one in six. So this is 16% chance, 17% chance that you actually have COVID. Right. And guess what? You just tested positive. So it goes from, oh, I definitely have COVID because I just tested positive to, to now. More than likely not. Def, like more than likely. Yeah, I do not have it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's good math. That checks out for sure. For yeah. sure, for sure. You yeah, just I have to that, break it down I think that the, checks the 10, out. And, 10 and the 50. So that's the thing. People, even doctors who you think they go to all this medical school, they're not properly well-versed or at least internalized in terms of statistics. I still think we could have gotten it wrong somewhere, but it's somewhere where it's like, it's not a surefire thing. And this happens all the time with rare diseases where only like one person in a thousand actually gets it. But then the false positive rate is say 5%. And now, now it's like, well it's only like a 2% chance that even if you test positive that you actually have it. Same thing you said with like alternative cancer treatment. It's like, they're not actually doing anything. The, the, the pe- it's again, survivorship bias, unfortunately, but you're no better off with any of those therapies, at least the ones that aren't like mainstream. It's just unclear. And that's why like sample size is a big thing uh, with all of this, like going back to the chimps thing. Like you just got to look at how many like, is it statistically significant? Yeah, let, let, let's stuff? leave them with that. It's the statistical significance. The difference here is, yes, we can look at probability of a dice roll. Yeah, we can look at probability you got two cards in a poker hand. But what Taleb is way more interested in is how do we put context to those two events, right? How do we put the context on the false positives or the context through Monte Carlo simulations? Um, because this contextualized probability totally different story i don't know what the fuck you're talking about but yes. it sounds like something <laughs> uh yeah stats uh, i never really like i did well in the sat but i have i suck at stats and i'm like trying to internalize it this is one of those books actually talk about um naval naval has his how to get rich without getting lucky that's basically the answer to this it's like hey most people that you see that are rich probably just got lucky doesn't mean all of them but most of them probably did. That's why it seems like the, the things that Naval says in that tweet storm, super simple. Yeah. There's nothing crazy about it. It's like super average person stuff. And so Naval... You're not going to get wildly rich, maybe. But well, rich if enough. if you leverage the yeah. fuck up. But that's the thing. So he, he says, all of Nassim's books are great. I agree. Skin in the game. I just I completely disagree. changed. Anti-fragile, at least on that front. Oh. Well, okay. Talk about Lindy really quick. The Lindy effect. Oh yeah, which let's, was let's from Skin in that. the Game. Lindy effect is this idea, and it was started in a restaurant in New York. There were people just talking about like Broadway shows, and they're like, "Oh, this show was around for 200 days," and they found that often, right when they kind of 
had that realization, it usually lasts like another 200 days or so. So it's kind of this heuristic of however long this idea or concept or whatever has been around, it's probably going to last around that much longer. So you what does last, that actually mean? Yeah. The Bible. I thought take, it was take like the Bible. All right. That's a book. It's clearly lasted 2000 years of time. So it's probably going to last like another 2000 or is that at least going to last a fucking while longer. That's the idea. So are you going to read the New York times bestseller for this year? Or should you read the Bible to be clear again? Because the New York times seller bestseller from this year will probably be around or relevant for one more year. That's it. Yeah. Or just like not that long, most likely. And so it's probably much better to read this book that's stood the test of time because it has some core principles about humanity and just the way we behave and what we connect with better to read that or better to read fooled by randomness. This was written 20 years ago. Well, what, what I'm even saying is yes, Taleb has stood the test of time, but I'm saying the things he's talking about here are thinking fast and slow. We should go to the primary source, Tversky and, and Kahneman, because that's probably from the 70s. Yeah. So that's just the longer shit's been around and still important. Take uh, influence, which I mentioned earlier. And that's from like the 40s. Talk or about no, tweets. Influence, sorry, that's like 70s maybe. Um, I was <laughs> this you said last night, like what this tweets? thing someone spent oh, a second putting yeah, into the yeah, universe. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. It's like Twitter. It, it made me realize with Twitter. Oh, I, there's one more thing I want to say after this. Uh, with Twitter, for example, you're getting all these tweets that literally just came up seconds ago. Like the most live action shit. It's probably only going to be important for another few seconds, statistically. Like a lot of Belky's tweets are shit. No one's ever going to see them. One again. second up, one second gone. Maybe once in a while there's going to be a good one and it'll last a little bit longer. But it just confirms this idea like it's probably not the most important thing to read. It's better to read an old book like I'm reading. I'm just starting to read a lot of old shit now. For different that's reasons. What everyone yeah. is saying. Um, yeah. The like, principles are there. Right. Uh, you had one oh, more thing. The last thing kind of goes back to checking the stock ticker. Like what, what really, uh, really sinks home for me. Cause this happens all sinks the time. Sinks home. Sinks. Oh my God. Uh, hits home. It sinks yeah, that's, in. That's good. I don't even know. Sinks what the fuck in, it's... Hits home. Grinds my gears. Different one. But what do you want? <laughs> what do you destiny. want today doing? All right. Sinks home. <laughs> sink us home. Loose lips. Sink ships. All right. So, Take messaging. All right. You got the loosest lips. Frequent. Look at those. Look at <laughs> my blueberry lips. Look. I go. I did a toothbrush room last just, night. An electric toothbrush Your teeth just to my still lips. still have a blue tint. Last uh, night I go in his room. He's just in bed like a child. And his lips are blue. His tongue is blue. In between his teeth are blue. Your tongue is still blue. Show him. <laughs> no, no. That's the filter on the camera. <laughs> blueberry lips. So, all right, all right. What, what hit home for me is like, Say you're texting a new boy or girl and you're, you're just waiting for their response. Well, in any moment you could either check it. <laughs> this is everything that sinks home for you. It all sinks home when you bring it to dating. So you could either get there's a, okay. This whole fucking COVID scare that we've had at a cancel. We can't talk about okay. it yet. Yeah, true. Okay. We can't talk. About I don't want to talk yet. about any of that. Okay. Cause people, yeah, people listen to this. Um, okay. So just say you're going to check it at any moment. It's either, did they respond or did they not? And most likely, they're not going to have responded. Like, Why? you can, ch like, in any single moment, like, the more time. Isn't it 50 50 at the one second timeline? Um, uh, I guess maybe it doesn't apply there. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's not the perfect analogy, uh, but it, it sinks in because, like, if I check at the end of today, so give it like 24 hours, there's probably going to be a okay. response there, or a lot, at least a lot more likely. Versus if I check it every two minutes, there's going to be a lot of negative responses. It's going to be like, oh, nothing, 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 nothing. And then it finally hits and it's like one good thing in all this noise. So there's like the one signal, all this fucking shitty noise versus if I just checked it once, there's like one signal and hardly any noise. So let's leave them with this. It's long-term patience. Wait, wait, oh, wait, wait, wait. Think of the tweet. Think of the tweet. No, no. Regurgitate. Short. <laughs> but, but it's the opposite in this one. It's having short-term patience for long-term um, agility or quickness. It usually goes the other way, but you just look like a different person. <laughs> Let's get out of here. All right. That was Fooled by Randomness by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, a baller uh, on a budget. Still don't he know who he is. Wrote, All right. wrote this book. Uh, so read it, I guess. <laughs> We're doing a book club on it, actually. So this was preparation for our friend's book club. Who knows? Maybe we'll do that another version. Seem fair. That doesn't seem fair. We practiced. 
I know we're going to roast them. <laughs> and the, we got another two weeks. They can't even read this. We read this in a day. All right. Woo. All right. We're back, baby. We're back. No, we're signing off. <laughs> it's over. <laughs>